enduring to the end, which leads to temple covenants. Obedience to the doctrine of Christ is the only way to return to the presence of Heavenly Father, the only hope for each succeeding generation. Most of us here have taken the first four steps to the doctrine of Christ. Our greatest challenge now is in the last step of the process, enduring to the end. When we are baptized and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, we are born again. We experience the joy that comes from the priceless gift of the Spirit's influence. Then we leave the meeting and walk outside of the chapel and someone drives by and splashes water on us or cuts us off in traffic and the delicate influence of the Holy Ghost, which will not abide unrighteous anger or sin of any kind, leaves us and once again we are natural men and women. Without the influence of the Spirit it is very difficult to understand and impossible to keep his commandments. What do we do now? We can't be baptized again. We can't receive again the laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost. Well, we go to the house of prayer. Having exercised our faith in the Savior and his atonement, having repented of our sins, and we partake of the sacred influence of the sacrament. We renew our covenants to keep his commandments, to remember him always, and to be willing to take upon us his name. What does it mean to take upon us the name of Christ? As my children are born into my family, they take upon themselves the name of Anderson. When we are born or reborn into the family of Christ, we take upon ourselves the name of Christ. King Benjamin described it this way. And now because of the covenant which ye have made, ye shall be called the children of Christ, his sons and his daughters. For behold, this day he has spiritually begotten you. For ye say that your hearts are changed through faith on his name. Therefore ye are born of him, and have become his sons and his daughters. When we worthily partake of the sacrament, we make and renew our sacred covenants. Once again, we receive the promised gift of the sacramental prayer, which is the Spirit of the Holy Ghost. The Spirit heals us and comforts us. Our feet are once again returned to the gospel path. We can now continue our journey back to the presence of God. The mighty change of heart is not a one-time epiphany. It happens over and over again, and the light within us grows brighter and brighter until the perfect day. But as the Apostle Paul taught, we cannot partake of the sacrament unworthily. Rather, we must first examine ourselves, exercising our faith in Jesus Christ and repenting of our sins. As we partake, we can sincerely promise God to, take, to try harder to keep His commandments and to remember Him always. Then the weeping miracle occurs. Our hearts are changed. We are born again, and we take upon us His name. Brothers and sisters, teach your children the doctrine of the sacrament. Help them prepare each week to receive its promised gift. Teach them that they may turn to Christ through the sacrament for a remission of their sins. At the very center of the Sabbath day is the sacrament. And at the very center of the sacrament is the atonement of Jesus Christ. The sacrament is the great ordinance of new beginnings. It is the ordinance which enables us to endure to the end. How then do we honor the Sabbath day in our homes? When we go to church, we enter the Lord's house as his special guests, for he graciously gives us the gift of the sacrament. When we return to our homes after our Sabbath meetings, we invite him into our house as our special guest. What gift can we give our Sabbath guest? We can give him order and peace. We can give him our hearts. It's not a matter of just eliminating from our Sabbath day conduct anything that might be inappropriate. We might find ourselves with not much left to do. We should fill our Sabbath day with those things that would be pleasing to our invited guest. Home-centered gospel teaching, beautiful music, worthy family activities, inspiring church literature and videos, and one of my favorites, family history activities. 
One of the great miracles of our time is the growing participation of our youth in temple and family history work. It thrilled me to read the recent announcement from our First Presidency of the expanded role of young women and young men who can now officiate in the sacred work of the temple baptistry. Young men and women, now more than ever before in the history of the world, you are a vital part of the great work of salvation in this last dispensation. The day following the recent dedication of one of the temples in our area, I received a copy of an email written by a state president, which I would like to share with his permission. Quote, Please pardon the interruption. My heart is so full. I wanted to share. The temple was absolutely flooded with youth this morning. The doors were scheduled to open at 5 a.m. As you can see, the line of youth went past the fountain and far down the sidewalk. When the temple presidency saw how many youth were there, they opened up the doors at 4.30 a.m. In the first two hours, more than 300 youth entered the font. The line of youth went up the stairwell and outside through, and well, outside up through about 9 a.m. Some waited for 90 minutes. They reverently sang hymns as they waited. By 6.30 a.m., the temple had run out of white baptismal clothing. With tears in his eyes, the temple president explained to the, those waiting in line that they would have to launder the white suits. The youth didn't leave. They happily waited to perform their ordinances. It was an absolutely incredible morning. These young people are amazing. The Savior has to be so well pleased. End quote. Family history work is a wonderful Sabbath day family activity. Parents, teach your children by precept and by example to honor the Sabbath day at home. As we honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy, the Lord will bless us, both spiritually and temporally. Recently, I presided in a state conference in Idaho. As I drove home through the windswept hills of northwestern Utah, I noticed, as I always do, a road sign about 25 miles south of Snowville, which reads Blue Creek. That is where my father was born. Today, as far as I can tell, nothing else remains in Blue Creek except the sign. It was a cold, windy, snowy, gray day. As I looked out at the lonely hills, I thought of my grandparents, Hans and Noah Anderson. <coughs> I tried for several years to scratch out a living on a small wheat farm in Blue Creek. I wondered how they did it. And yet they raised a wonderful, faithful family of ten children who have since raised wonderful, faithful families of their own. I remember a story that we often tell in my family about my grandparents who lost two successive wheat crops to an early frost. Their third wheat crop was up and the heads were just beginning to mature when they received the dreaded news that an early frost was expected. On Sunday morning, my grandfather hitched up the horses, loaded the family in the wagon, and traveled the seven miles to Howell, where they attended their church meetings, as they always did. In those days, the members of the church attended Sunday school in the morning and sacrament meeting in the afternoon. And so it was evening when my grandparents returned to the farm. After unhitching the horses, Hans Anderson went into his bedroom and spent some time reading the scriptures. Then he went out into his field and knelt in prayer, pleading with the Lord to save his wheat crop. A neighbor who had also planted wheat that year saw him pray and scolded him. You won't save your crop by going off to church all day and then saying a prayer, he said. You should have stayed home and worked like I did. Well, early the next morning, my grandfather came out to survey his field. He rejoiced to see that his wheat had, was still standing tall. His crops had been safe. His neighbor's wheat, however, was dark and droopy, frozen by the frost. When the neighbor saw my grandfather, he made a comment that has become somewhat of a mantra in my family. Hans, he said, I have seen Frost do some funny things in my life, but I have never seen it follow a fence line. 
Dear brothers and sisters, if you would keep the fire of faith burning brightly in your lives and in the lives of your posterity, honor the Sabbath day, keep it holy, and teach your children to do likewise. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, quote, It is in no sense an exaggeration, nor does it overstate the fact one would to say that any person who keeps the Sabbath according to the revealed pattern will be saved in the celestial kingdom. I add my testimony to his in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And now, brothers and sisters, it will be our privilege to hear from Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Following Elder Holland, the closing hymn and the benediction will take place in your respective stake centers. Father Holland, we love you and sustain you and are anxious to now receive your message. Dear brothers and sisters of the North America Central Area, how delighted we are to be having a conference with you, even if it is by video broadcast. We would much rather be there personally but you're a very big area, stretching from Dawson Creek, British Columbia, to Guyman, Oklahoma, to Gillum, Manitoba, to Marinette, Wisconsin, which is a stretch of over three million square miles. That would test our ability to scoot around the area and shake every hand, though we would love to do that. Forgive us if we're coming to you on the screen, and please know how much we love you and how grateful we are for your service and your devotion. The longer I live and the more my years in this calling begin to add up, the more grateful I am for the devoted, faithful, conscientious members of the church everywhere, including the North America Central Area. You who love the Lord, love each other, and do all that you can to strengthen the church and the kingdom of God on earth. You are a tremendous inspiration to me, a true marvelous work and a wonder. I hope you know how sincerely I mean that and how overwhelming my life would be, along with just a handful of general authorities and general officers of the church, if we had to try to do all that you do faithfully, week in and week out. We're in this together and we love you for so serving. Thank you. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. I'm particularly thrilled to be here today with Elder Wilford Anderson, Elder Matthew Carpenter, Sister Jean Bingham, along with the testimonies and the participation of your local leaders at the beginning and the end of this conference. We have been magnificently taught today. It's a wonderful time to be a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but then it always has been. This dispensation began with a grand vision, a monumental revelation in the sacred grove near Palmyra. And revelation has continued from then right down to the present hour in Grand Prairie and Alamosa, Butte and Bismarck, St. Louis and Edmonton. Yes, in every other location in your area. President Russell M. Nelson has been building on the revelatory foundation laid by his prophetic predecessors. And those who follow President Nelson will build on his contributions. In just the past few years, the Lord has been directing the lowering of the missionary age for both elders and sisters. Five years ago, we began to implement a wholesale revision of the curriculum of the church a revision that continues with new elements on January 1, 2019. In 2020, a new youth program will begin for all young people from ages 8 to 18. Last April, we introduced the ministering concept as a way to show our love for God and for our neighbor. We thank Sister Bingham for that marvelous message on that subject today. At the same time, the Lord directed a historic merger of all Melchizedek priesthood bearers in a ward into a common, powerful, united elders' quorum. 
More recently, President Nelson has had us focus on the true revealed name of the church in order that we pay due credit to the Son of God whose church this is. At October conference, we introduced a more balanced, home-centered, church-supported focus for both teaching the gospel and living the gospel. Elder Anderson spoke about that in the home on the Sabbath day. We've created latitude for when home evening is held, including several possibilities on Sunday, while still retaining an activity night for families on Monday, if that is desired. Beginning in January 2019, we will focus on a two-hour meeting schedule on Sunday, with the idea that the third hour and more will be pursued in the home, making the Sabbath day, as Elder Anderson said, considerably more pleasant for the elderly, young mothers with children, new converts, those who have to drive great distances, and so forth. The sheer mathematics of our gospel living have dictated that increased emphasis on the home is essential. There are 168 hours in a week. And whether you spend two or three of those hours at the meeting house hardly seems relevant when you consider the other 165. Clearly, we need to do more with the entire week in our homes, at school, and in our workplaces. And temples, temples. How grateful we are for this era of temple building and temple going. All of this has created a wonderful atmosphere of enthusiasm with one of the most oft-quoted passages that we hear among each other. It comes from Oliver Cowdery's pen, who wrote of his opportunities to translate for the prophet Joseph. These were days never to be forgotten. Truly, brothers and sisters, the standard of truth has been erected. No unhallowed hand can stop the work from progressing. In the time I have with you today, I wish to pick up on one of President Nelson's favorite themes that, in this case, neither Sister Bingham nor Elder Carpenter nor Elder Anderson have been able to address. I want to touch on that where he speaks of the gathering of scattered Israel one of the divinely appointed responsibilities that God has given to all of us. Bringing people to the gospel through baptism plays such a crucial, irreplaceable part in the plan of salvation because none of the other redeeming principles and none of the other saving ordinances can have their effect until one is actually in the faith and has at least begun walking the covenant path. There's no way in the world we could talk to people in any meaningful way about the significance of the temple or the promises of eternal families or the blessings of paying tithes and offerings or whatever if they have not first entered into the gate beyond which all those other commandments and opportunities lie. Baptism, based on faith and repentance, is in the jargon of the day how you put skin in the gospel game. We are trying to give scattered Israel her blessings, including the blessings of every promise ever made to her. But those blessings must be initiated in the baptismal font. Initial promises about the salvation of the human family were given to Adam and Eve, later to Seth and Enoch and Noah, so on down to a majestic promise given to Abraham, considered to be the grand patriarch of the posterity of God's chosen people. Then there were additional promises given to his son, Isaac, and finally culminating promises given to Isaac's son, Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, and then to his 12 sons, who constituted the 12 lines or tribes of ancient Israel. You know that history that followed as well as I do. Unfortunately, it was a long story of war and rebellion, of unrighteousness and captivity. There were bright spots here and faithful people there, but by and large, the children of God have rejected the prophets, killed many of them, and broken the everlasting covenants that they had made with their God. 
10 of those 12 tribes were carried away captive and became lost to their fellow men and women. Two remaining tribes, that of Judah and Benjamin, continued intact for a time, but then they too were taken captive more than once, and their difficulties back and forth in the region of the Holy Land continues unabated to this very day. Truly, ancient Israel had a hand in fulfilling her own destiny. I will scatter you among the heathen, God had said, and that he surely did. But fortunately, God's promises regarding the gathering of those scattered Israelites was equally emphatic and much more hopeful. The promise of the gathering, woven all through the fabric of the scriptures, would be fulfilled just as surely as were the prophecies of the scattering of Israel. Finally, the Savior himself would come, but he too was rejected by the people, criticized for his message, and finally crucified. Upon his resurrection, he charged his apostles to go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost. In short, he told them to keep gathering scattered Israel. Keep trying to give Israel her inheritance. But the people continued basically in their pattern of rejecting the truth and killing the prophets, and now that included killing the apostles. Ushering in nearly two millennia of more dark apostasy and the loss of priesthood keys, about which Elder Carpenter has testified. This is a complete restoration required by God the Father with Jesus Christ in attendance, calling the prophet Joseph Smith to be the founding prophet of this, the last and greatest of all dispensations. All divine powers of previous times were going to be restored through him. This dispensation would not be limited by our geography, and it would not end in apostasy. By the time it was complete, it would fill the world. As part of that restoration, there would come the long-awaited gathering of scattered Israel. Indeed, that gathering would be a sign that the latter-day work had truly begun. I will give unto you a sign, he said, that I shall gather in from their long dispersion my people, O house of Israel, and shall establish again among them my Zion. May I quote President Nelson on what this means for us today? He has said, Here on earth, missionary work is crucial. Servants of the Lord have gone forth proclaim, proclaiming the restoration. In many nations, our missionaries are searching for those of scattered Israel. They hunt for them out of the holes of the rocks, and they fish for them as in ancient days. Continuing this quote, in the early days of the church, conversion often meant gathering to a new location. Every nation is the gathering place for its own people now. The place of gathering for Brazilian saints is in Brazil. The place of gathering for Nigerian saints is in Nigeria. The place of gathering for Korean saints is in Korea, and so forth. Zion is the pure in heart. Zion is wherever righteous saints are. That's the close of President Nelson's quote. Yet, even as we acknowledge that, we testify of the special role that North America and the central region of the United States will play in many of your lives and will yet play in these last days and concluding work, work that can only be done from the New Jerusalem. To prepare for that day, we're all joining in the call every prophet has made for a special effort to gather scattered Israel. To the youth of the church, on June 3rd, President Nelson said he wanted the young people to be, quote, part of something big, something grand, something majestic. <laughs> Continuing, he said, you were sent to earth at this precise time, the most crucial time in the history of the world, to help gather Israel. There's nothing happening on this earth right now that is more important than that. This is the mission 
for which you were sent to earth. I'm inviting, he said, every young man and every young woman between the ages of 12 and 18 in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to enlist in the youth battalion to help gather scattered Israel. More recently, in the sister session of October Conference, he noted that the Relief Society presidency at the ward level, along with the Elders Corn presidency at that same level, is now organized to add missionary work to their portfolio, with a specific assignment for that work falling probably to one of the counselors in each of those presidencies. Of this development, President Nelson said to the sisters, you remember last June, Sister Nelson and I spoke to the youth of the church and enlisted them in the Lord's Youth Battalion to help gather scattered Israel. This is a cause that desperately needs women because women shape the future. So tonight I'm extending a prophetic plea to you, the women of the church, to help the future by helping to gather scattered Israel. In a recent trip to Canada, hello to you up there in Raymond, one of the participants said that night that President Nelson taught much like he has done in the past. He taught us the gospel, taught us gospel principles and doctrine, and then invited us to follow him in sharing the gospel with others and helping to gather scattered Israel. We left with the feeling that we can have a more important and very significant part in the role of gathering Israel back home to Zion. End of quote of that participant in Canada. Just a few days ago in the Dominican Republic, just slightly out of your area, he said to the missionaries in a missionary meeting, inviting others to Christ and gathering scattered Israel is your great opportunity. And it won't stop when you get off your missions. It won't stop when you get to be 93 years of age. There was laughter there. This is going to keep going until the great Jehovah says, the work is done. Brothers and sisters, there is a delightful urgency in the air. And it focuses on gathering scattered Israel on both sides of the veil. May I conclude with two brief clips of the kinds of things the church is producing that should help us catch the spirit that President Nelson is bringing to this great missionary endeavor. I invite you to become aware of the many, many other audiovisual aids, Mormon messages, and various teaching tools that you could use as reminders of the comfortable, normal, natural ways we have to share the gospel. The first of these is entitled simply, Welcome. The second is entitled, This is the Church. It says welcome on here, and here, and on Mormon chapels everywhere, and we mean it. Come sit with us. Come stand with us. Come celebrate, and serve, and love, and learn, and love some more. Welcome to a community where we think of each other as family, and act like we actually are. Because that's what Jesus taught, to love one another, to bear each other's burdens, and to try every day to be a little bit better, a little bit kinder, a little more welcoming. Because that's what Jesus taught. He can make you a better person, and he can make us a better church. This is a church. This is a believer. This is a hymn. These are thoughts and prayers. This is loving your enemy. Loving your neighbor. Loving God. This is faith. This is forgiveness. This is hallelujah. This is religion. 
This is organized religion. This is church. May I conclude with my testimony of the unfolding of this grand and true work in this the last and greatest of all dispensations. I know and bear witness that God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ appeared to the prophet Joseph Smith who became the prophet of the restoration. I know that following his martyrdom Joseph was succeeded in that prophetic role by Brigham Young, then John Taylor, then Wolford Woodruff, down to now Russell F. Nelson. I bear testimony that the work will continue unbroken and unabated for however many years and however many prophets it takes until indeed the Savior declare, declares the work is finished. May we accept the responsibility to share the gospel with others and gather the flock of Israel as someone earlier gathered us. I pray for this in the name of the Good Shepherd who gave his life <coughs> for the flock. May we give others the gift given to us in the name of Jesus Christ. <coughs>